Hello, and welcome back to another art tutorial video with Mr. White. In this video, we're going to explore how we can draw a variety of textures with a pencil. We're going to be drawing these on individual cubes so that we can experiment using a few different textures with some different values to them as well. The first texture that we're going to try is a grass and we'll also be able to use it for fur. This texture grows directionally. Grass grows up from the ground, and it, get, it has a thinner point and a thicker base, generally. Fur grows out from the skin or flesh of the animal. This texture is a linear texture made of many layered lines that all have, follow the same sort of logic or pattern, which is growing upward or outward. This means that some of those lines will be closer to us and some will be further away or covered up. It also means that there's going to be variety to them. So not every line will be exactly the same. Some will be longer and shorter, thicker and thinner, etc. And when we're using this technique, we can create a sense of space or depth in our artwork by using smaller lines further away from us. For this technique, I recommend starting with a light base value in the pencil, using upward directional marks, holding the pencil at a shallow angle, and using a wide surface. This lets you fill the whole area with a very basic version of the texture we're looking for, and then you can go ahead and add another layer on top. Notice there's space in between my marks. You want to do the same. Once you have a nice light base value in the whole box, you're going to go in holding the pencil at a more steep angle using the tip of the pencil and drawing lines that start low and go upward trying to keep approximately the same length for each line and trying to lift the pencil off at the top of your mark. Notice that we are not drawing in a zigzag pattern. We are drawing up and then moving the pencil back to the starting position. So each mark is just on the upstroke. Notice also that I'm layering so that my longest marks are low on the page or in that box, and they get there's a layer above that that is somewhat shorter, a short layer above that, and a very short layer at the very top. I encourage you to take a moment to blend just gently, running your finger with the texture or the direction of your marks. Now here I made a cube out of my box by having the same rectangular angle in the same length of line come off from three adjacent corners and then connected those with a horizontal and a vertical line. Next, I drew a light, which helps me to have an idea of which of where the light is coming from in the scene. And then I do the exact same process, but with a darker base value and heavier pressure on the far side, the darker side, and a lighter base value and lighter pressure for the texture on top. And that is a satisfactory grassy texture in three values. So now I'm going to go ahead and make another box to make another texture. For this box, we are going to be making a brick-like texture. What do we know about bricks? Well, these are human-made objects that have a logic and order to them. Bricks are generally the same size and shape of a sort of rectilinear form. We know that they form a repeating rectangular pattern, and that generally there will be sort of very similar layers alternating. 
the surface is going to have a rough text here. And we also want to remember that the lines between the bricks, the grout or mortar, is lighter than the brick itself. So I'm going to start by dividing my, my square into long rectangles with individual rows going across the page or across that box. And the top rectangle, I decided to draw two vertical lines, dividing it into three approximately even rectangles. And I used that as the size for all of my grid or all of my bricks. Then I skipped a line and copied the same vertical lines in the next or third row. We're going to use that same structure. And in the second, fourth, and sixth rows, the vertical lines should be lined up just about with the center of the brick above and below them. Once I have my bricks all laid out, I go in with the flat of my pencil and I lightly thicken the lines in between my bricks, giving a good amount of space for my grout. Then I went and I darkened up the line that borders each brick. Finally, I went into each brick's surface and I'm giving it a sort of scumbling, slightly scribbly, rough texture, trying to keep some areas white, some areas dark, and a lot that is middly. Notice that bricks have a good amount of variety within them, but they have a rough surface feel. You can go in at the end and add a little bit more value just to make sure that everything feels right and matches. On the far side, I'm going to go ahead and extend those same rows of bricks, but instead of using a horizontal line, I'm again using diagonals. And I'm again trying to make a logical stacking or order of the bricks. Now remember that this is our darker side, so we still want a scumbling texture, but we want to make sure that this side is darker than the one that we just finished. If it's not, that's okay. You can gently lay over another layer of value over the whole thing, as long as you are considering your direction of your marks. Then we're going to do the same thing on the top, but again, remember that the top should be the lightest side, so I went in and I had to erase slightly. Now we're going to make another texture, so we're going to go ahead and make another square, making sure to leave room for a fourth texture, as well as allowing both of them to become cubes. So we're going to start with a square and make a cube using those three diagonal lines coming off of adjacent corners. For this texture, we're going to make waves or a watery texture. Now let's think about what we know about water and waves. Once again, this is going to be a linear sort of texture. There are going to be layers of individual waves, which are high spots in the water, followed by low spots or troughs in the water. This is a repeating texture that makes a pattern. And again, that pattern is made of peaks where the water is higher and more likely to be reflecting the sun or the light around us, and troughs where the water is likely to be lower and in shadow. Often there will be some sort of an arch or a curve in the shape of the line. And we want to make sure and let our, our water be reflective. So we want, instead of using a base value, we're going to not. And instead, we're going to use a fairly flat section of our pencil. If you need to scribble a little to get a flat area, go right ahead. And we're going to make a linear pattern, which has these sort of arcs 
reaching up to peaks using fairly low pre or medium to low pressure and leaving a decent amount of space in between our lines. Once we have that whole box filled vertically, we're going to go in and above each line, fill with a gentle shading most of that space. Notice that I'm trying to leave it a little bit darker on the line and let that value get slightly lighter as it approaches the next wave. My goal here is to leave some spots that are white or very close to white while filling most of the space with a medium gray and letting the lines be fairly dark. So just like we've been doing, we're going to move on to the right hand side of this. We're going to follow that same pattern that adjust the angle to match the angle of our cube. And we're going to fill in the negative spaces, this time using a little bit heavier pressure and filling the negative spaces a little bit more so that their overall effect is darker. We can go on to the top as well, keep the same texture but much lighter marks. Now we're going to move on to our final texture. And for this, again, we're using a big square that turns into a cube. I didn't quite leave myself enough room for a good shadow. I wish I'd had a little more, but that's how it goes. In this box, we're going to make a wood grain texture. Now, wood grain is a common one in art, and this one, again, is made of layers of line. This is an organic texture, so that means that it has some natural variation. It should be imperfect. And what do we know about wood and how those lines are formed? Well, wood forms in a variety of rings. And those rings circle each other, so there's a logic to them. There should be ring upon ring upon ring. And those end up forming lines, depending on how the wood is cut. But because it's organic, because these lines are made by the growth of the tree in different conditions year to year, the lines in between should not be perfect. They should have some variety to them. We also know that wood has some eyes or sort of circular forms that are in part of it. Now, I would encourage you to divide the square into three or four long rectangles, which we can think of as boards. I'm going to give a good dark line between each of those rectangles, trying to keep a fairly straight edge. There are a bunch of ways that we can make wood. And if we, what we're going to do is make lines that run mostly horizontally, they go mostly across that wood or that board that form layers. And those layers should have some variety in how far apart they are. They should be fairly close, but they should not be exactly perfect. We want lines where some are a little closer than others, some are a little further away, and they show that sort of character or growth. Sometimes in a piece of wood, we'll get an effect where we can sort of see where the lines have a curve to them. And you'll see on my second board that I added at sort of on the far right hand side, I had my lines curve around each other so that I get sort of a, almost an ellipse or a, a pretty rough oval. But again, these lines form layers that reinforce one another. Now, on my third board, I'm going to add in an eye. And this is basically kind of a circle or a knot. It's going to be a roughly an oval or elliptical shape that makes a few layers around it. And as you head out in those layers, each layer should start to get a little bit longer 
until those layers just add in to the long grain of the wood. And I'm going to again have an arcing curve showing the end of the grain of that wood on my fourth board, making sure that I have my layers, multiple layers of my texture. As I move on to my final sides, I'm again going to keep that same texture, making those lines, those layers of a pattern. But again, having a darker value on the right hand side and a very light value at the top. For the darker side, you may want to add a base tone of a kind of a medium, light medium gray, and then you can add in those layered, slightly angling or curving lines with a heavier pressure, so you get a really nice dark darkness. Don't be afraid to add some knots into your wood where the branches grow out from the boards, or would have grown out before the tree was cut up. And there we have it. Now hopefully you'll be able to make four different textures in a variety of values in your artwork. Happy making. Thanks for watching.